grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now throughout the remainder of this day, throughout the remainder of this hour, short, uncertain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall see him as he is in all his glory and go to be with him throughout eternity. Amen. The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John in the third chapter and the eighth verse. The eighth verse in the third chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. We are dealing particularly with the this word so, like that, similar to that, is every one that is born of the Spirit. We are dealing, in other words, with the marks, or the characteristics, if you like, of the new life, the new life which is in Christ Jesus and which is given to those who are born again. We are doing this because this is one of those foundational principles in connection with the Christian life, the failure to understand which must of necessity not only lead to trouble but to eventual disaster. This is the great thing, as we've been seeing, that is emphasized in this well-known story concerning Nicodemus, this ruler of the Jews who went to seek an interview with our Lord one night. Here was a man who was anxious to go on, seeing something in our Lord which he clearly hadn't got himself. He was anxious to have this. But as the whole story indicates, our Lord, recognizing exactly the man's position, knowing, as we are told at the end of the previous chapter, what is in men, the truth about every one of us, our Lord interrupts him and points out to him that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, leave alone enter into it. He must be born again, born of water and of the Spirit. Now, here was the trouble with Nicodemus, and I've been suggesting that it is the trouble still with large numbers of people especially perhaps those who have been brought up in a Christian atmosphere, home, church, Sunday school, and so on. It is this fatal error of assuming that we are Christian, which leads in turn, of course, to a desire to grow before we've been born, the desire to continue on a journey when really we are not on the right road at all. That's the great lesson of this story, and therefore... We are interpreting it like this, that the first thing we have to do is to discover whether or not we have been born again. Here is this great announcement at the very portal of the way that leads to God and to heaven. And it informs us that except and unless we be born again, we have no entry and we have no part or portion in this life of God. And therefore, it is the most serious thing which people can ever consider together. And we've been looking at some of the characteristics of this life. I've said that a man who is truly born again reveals that. It is the most obvious thing about him. We read of our Lord in the Gospels that uh, he could not be hid. And the Christian can't be hid. If there is this life of God in the soul, it makes itself known. It's the most obvious thing about us. There are other things still true of us, but this is the most obvious and outstanding thing. It's the thing that marks us above everything else. We've also seen that uh, we are conscious of being dealt with, we've been humbled, we've truly repented. There is a fundamental seriousness about us, not a pomposity or a solemnity, but a fundamental seriousness, as there was in our Lord, who was described as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That was because of the world into which he came. It should be true of us. 
We're also conscious, we've seen, of a new life and a new nature within us. And that in turn leads us to be surprised at ourselves. I cannot see that a man can be a Christian without being amazed at himself. If you can understand yourself and all that you're doing, I say it's indicative of the fact that the new life is not in you. But when the new life comes, when you're made a partaker of the divine nature, you can scarcely believe that you are who and what you are. This thing is uh, so astounding and so different. And in turn, we saw that that leads to the fact that uh, other people can see the difference. This life, when it comes, becomes a kind of sword, separating us, dividing us, even from those who may be members of our own family, as our Lord has put it. And everybody senses this. Not only the men who have the new life, the others who lack it are aware that there's something new and something different about this person. And finally, we ended last Sunday morning with indicating that it also, and of necessity, involves a spiritual understanding. That was the thing that poor Nicodemus hadn't got. He couldn't understand. How can a man be born when he's old, he says? That's the rationalist. That's the natural man with his own powers. How can these things be? You see, but once a man receives this life, it leads to understanding. And the Apostle Paul is able to claim for himself and all who are born again, all who have become spiritual, we have the mind of Christ. Very well. But clearly it doesn't stop there. The next thing I want to direct attention to is this. And the analogy, of course, makes this obvious and inevitable. Once one has this life, which leads to this spiritual apprehension and understanding, one always desires more and more of this knowledge and understanding. This is a characteristic of life. There is this principle of growth in life. You see it in the seed. There it is. You put the little seed into the ground, but there's a germ of life there. And that's always expanding and growing, stretching out, seeking more and more. That is the great characteristic of life. The thing that differentiates uh, something living uh, from an inanimate object, a machine. And uh, this is very true of uh, others who are born again. You know the uh, scripture uh, reminds us that we go through these stages. We are born, we are babes in Christ. Then we begin to grow. We become children. We become young men. This is John's classification in his first epistle. Children, young men, old men. There's this growth and this development. That is the nature of this life as it is of every other kind of life. And therefore, we are entitled to deduce from this that one of the marks of the man who is born again is that he desires more. More of this food, more of this drink, more of this nutriment which is going to feed his mind and enable it to understand more and better and to go on and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Now, let's be clear about this. This obviously is something that varies. I'm not saying that there's a standard which, uh, uh, which one must always desider it in every particular case. Obviously not. As you get variations in growth, between members of the same family and you get variations in the rate of growth in every one of us. So it happens in the spiritual life. All I'm contending for is that there is this element of desire for more. Now, there are, this is put to us in many ways in the scripture. Take that verse which we read just now from the first epistle of Peter, the second chapter. As newborn babes Desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, you see the supposition. If you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, he's arguing in a sense, though he puts it in the form of an exhortation, you will desire more of this unadulterated, pure word. 
And uh, th th that is something which is true. He's got a picture, do you see, of a babe, newborn babe. Desire. The sincere milk of the world. There is one way, and then the Apostle Paul puts it in his way, puts it in terms of his own experience. And uh, this, this is, it seems to me, the norm that we should always be recognizing and by which we should judge ourselves. The great Apostle, in spite of his amazing experiences, his unusual attainments, the work that he had been privileged to do as the apostle to the Gentiles, can still say this in Philippians 3, verse 10. This is his desire, that I may know him. You see, he, the things he used to glory in and boast of, he now says, I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. That's what he's after. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection from among the dead, not as though I had already attained. He's not satisfied. He hasn't arrived. He hasn't reached the goal, not as though I had already attained either, were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but there's one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. That's it. You see, he's not satisfied with what he has. He has a great deal. He knows so much. He thanks God for that. But he's not satisfied. He requires and desires more and he's pressing after it. He can never have too much of this. Now, I say the very nature of the life principle within us produces that desire. In other words, a very good test of life is this, an awareness of our ignorance. An awareness of our ignorance. The more a man knows in any realm or department, the more he's aware of his ignorance. And it's very true here. With this life, you're given this spiritual apprehension and knowledge. And that in turn makes you aware of your ignorance. You become aware, for instance, of your past ignorance. And you're amazed at yourself. How often have I been told this? And there's nothing that rejoices the heart of a preacher and a pastor more than this. People come to me and say, you know, I simply cannot understand how I was so slow in seeing it. I'm amazed at myself. The ignorance they remained in perhaps uh, for years... But now they see it. And uh, they see, of course, the terrible danger of ignorance. That is the ultimate trouble with the unbeliever that he's ignorant. You see, this is truth. And truth is something that gives light and instruction and knowledge to the mind and to the understanding. And a man, when he's born again, begins to realize that he had been dwelling in the ignorance of darkness. The Apostle Paul who says that about himself, you remember. He's amazed that he's a preacher at all. He, that this grace should be given to him who was before, he says, a blasphemer and a, a persecutor and an injurious person. But he said, I did it ignorantly, in unbelief. And the moment a man receives the life and the light and the knowledge, he sees his former ignorance and he's appalled at it. He's horrified at it. That he could remain in such ignorance. Fancy a man like this persecuting Christ, hating him, regarding Christ as a blasphemer. He sees it now. And he's appalled at the terrible dangers of ignorance. And that, of course, stimulates at once the desire to receive greater and greater knowledge. He realizes what he's missed in the past. And he doesn't want to go on missing this. Now, this is how this argument works. It works uh, unconsciously, subconsciously, if you like, 
But it does work, and, and, and the man, therefore, is desirous of greater and greater knowledge. And on top of that, he begins to realize the dangers of ignorance in this way. Here he is now. He is being given the mind of Christ. The Spirit has revealed the deep things of God to him. And he is clear, as we were indicating last Sunday morning, about the fundamental doctrines of salvation. Yes, but he also becomes aware, as he never was before, of the adversary, of the enemy, of the accuser of the brethren, of the subtleties of the devil. He knew nothing about that before. The unbeliever, you know, not only doesn't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he doesn't believe in the devil. And that's a very good test of whether a man is a believer or not, whether he believes in the devil or not. He ridicules this, even more than he ridicules the doctrines of salvation. He knows nothing about our conflict, which is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the powers, our adversary, the devil. But the believer, he's got this knowledge. And so... A man who's got new life and who's got this spiritual apprehension and understanding realizes that in many senses he's in a very dangerous position. He's going to be the special object of the attacks of the devil. What will the devil do with him? Well, what the devil will do now, of course, is not to, to try to ridicule the whole of Christianity. What the devil will now do with, with him will be to, to try to uh, insinuate uh, certain heresies certain errors, certain doubts and queries and questions about particular matters. That's what the devil did in the early church. As you see in the New Testament, that's what he's been doing ever since. He's very active at the present time, and amongst evangelicals. They're looking again at the early chapters of Genesis. Have they been wrong all the years? They're looking again at evolution, and so on. The supernatural. You see, this is, this is the subtlety of the devil. Now, the man who is truly spiritual, and not merely as an intellectual knowledge of the Bible, he recognizes these subtle dangers. And therefore he has a fear of going astray, of being led astray into error, into heresy, into mistaken notions. He can see from the New Testament that it happened to the early Christians. The history of the church confirms that. And so he's aware of this terrible danger as it confronts him. And therefore his very instinct urges him to have more and more of this knowledge. You see what I'm trying to suggest to you, my dear friends, if you are one of those people who say, ah, oh, yes, I took my decision, been a Christian ever since, and you don't want very much more, well, you know what a lot it tells us about you, doesn't it? The people who think they've got it all, that they've arrived, they had it in one packet, as it were, and they don't need any more. Of course, what you find about them is, that at the end of 50 years, they're exactly as they were at the beginning. They don't know anymore. They don't understand anymore. They've got no deeper experience. They started as babes, and they end as babes, though they may be old in years. They're still spiritual babes. And you'll find oftentimes that such children are fractious, and they dislike learning. They dislike knowledge. They don't want further understanding. The suggestion that they are not complete, they dislike very much indeed. Children often don't want to go to school. Well, it's very true in the spiritual realm. But when there is true life, it begins to understand these dangers and it requires more knowledge, more instruction, further light on these spiritual problems in order to be saved from these various errors and dangers. But then, I, let me put this positively because it's much more wonderful when you do look at it in the positive way. A man who really has got this life in him, and this spiritual understanding, he realizes that he's like a man who's been brought in from the street into a great palace. There he was in the street with the rain and the mud, lacking food and lacking anything that gives a real delight and satisfaction. Suddenly he's taken hold of and he's brought in, he's given a new dress, He's cleansed in the vestibule and he's ushered into this great palace. And there there is food and there are treasures of art and of knowledge and of everything. Now the Christian is a man who realizes that that's the truth about him. The Christian is not merely a man who knows now that he's been forgiven. And that's the end of it all. Not at all. 
That's merely the introduction. He's been ushered into this great treasure house. What's he facing? Well, the Apostle Paul puts it in these words in writing to the Ephesians in chapter 3. He says that he is commissioned now to go to declare among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable. Or he puts it later on in that same third chapter that he, he's, his business is to make known unto people what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that he might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now the moment a man gets any sort of inkling of that well of course he, he is stretching every nerve he wants to get at this and get after it. Look at all this tremendous treasure. And he is anxious to partake of it. Do you know anything of this eagerness? Do you know anything of this hunger and thirst after this? Do you feel that in a sense you want to spend the whole of your time after this delving into the mystery, the profundities of this great word of God? All the treasure that is here. You see it in a word opening out and expanding and you're following it and you can't keep up with it because it's ever going ahead of you and eluding you, pressing toward the mark. Not satisfied, how can you be? What you've got is wonderful, of course it is. But you don't stop there. It's like a man at a great banquet, if you like. You don't spend the whole of your time just drinking soup. That's merely an appetizer. That's merely something to stimulate your appetite. Look at the menu, my dear friend. Look right through it. Can't you see it? Go on, go on. There's an order in these things, but it gets more wonderful as you go on with it. Now, the man I say was born again is a man who has some consciousness of this. And there is this deep desire within him to have more and more of the sincere milk of the word, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Now, let me put this still more particularly in this way. And I'm doing this because I'm trying to be very practical in this matter. This, uh, I'm about to say, I be believe more and more, is a very valuable and a very subtle test in this very matter. Let's test ourselves by it. The man who's got true spiritual life is always a man who is not content with the preliminaries. What do I mean by that? Well, as I've been saying, there are steps and stages in this truth. There is foundational truth. That's not my term, it's the apostles' term. Other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid. But then, you see, you build on the foundation and you go on. Or, to use the language of the author of the epistle to the Hebrews, there are what he calls, uh, in the first verse of chapter 6 of his great epistle, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. What do you mean by principles? Well, if you like, he means first principles, the elements, the beginning, the simple foundational truths. But that is only the introduction. They lead to others. And these, of course, because they're deeper, are more difficult. And they in turn lead to others that are still deeper and still more difficult. As you go on, you have to use your mind more, you have to make a greater effort. Now, this is something that uh, we all surely must agree with. Anybody who's ever studied any subject knows that. You have your preliminary lectures, you read the early chapters of the book, it's fairly simple and plain sailing. But as you go on, it becomes more involved, it becomes more difficult, and you have to make your effort. Yes, but you're going on and you're grasping it more and more, and you're hoping eventually you'll get right out into the depths. Now, it's exactly like that in this a spiritual life. And this, I say, is a most important test. You know, take it in terms of the Bible itself. I think it's quite right that children should only read a few verses of the Bible every day. They're children. And you treat them as children. But when people in older age, later on in life, have been Christians for many years, are still only reading a little section. Surely there's something wrong. 
And then take books which help you with the Bible. Oh, well, if you're a child, well, you want uh, just a little comment. You remember they used to bring out books at one time? I remember it well, novels and other things. They brought them out under a edition called Told to the Children. What they did was this, of course. They abstracted the story from the whole book to make it easy for the children. Told to the children. Quite right. That's absolutely sound method. It's good teaching. But, of course, as you get older, you don't read the edition told to the children. You read the whole thing. You have to wade through a lot of stuff that may appear to be very uninteresting, but the more you do it, the more you appreciate it, and the more you enjoy it. Now, I say there's something wrong when people still go on with the told to the children edition of the scriptures and the comment on the scriptures. As one goes on, one should be aware of the depth of the truth, and one should be aware of the struggle to apprehend it and be ready to make the effort and to de desire to do so in order that one may enter into this apprehension of something which is bigger and deeper and still more difficult. Now, let me show you how the author of the epistle to the Hebrews makes this very point. You see, he's writing to these Hebrews to comfort them and to encourage them in a time of tribulation through which they were passing. And he wants to unfold the great truth to them, particularly the great truth about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was their initial trouble, indeed their central error. And having put it in various forms, comparing him and contrasting him with the prophets and with the angels and with Moses and Aaron, he comes to this great truth concerning the Lord Jesus Christ as our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And this, he says, is the most wonderful thing of all. But then he has to put it like this in chapter 5, uh, verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For strong, everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are full, of full age, even those who by reason of use of their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's the position. And I'm arguing that a man who truly has this life within him, given this apprehension of the deeper truth, is anxious to obtain it and is therefore anxious to make this effort. He wants to go on and to appropriate this. He's no longer with the childish, almost babyish form. Christian people, are we still taking Christian truth in a tabloid form? Or are we facing it and tackling it on a deeper level? We're living in an age, of course, which takes everything and wants everything in tabloid form. It's the age of digests. Even in biographies, they no longer write a full biography. It's a sort of study, a kind of picture. What's gone wrong with us? Well, it's, this is the tragedy, I feel, of the hour. Uh, people want everything short, snappy. That's the word, snappy and simple. They say direct. Uh, but there it is. It's in a digest, tabloid form. And they start like that, and they go on throughout the whole of their lives. Our fathers, you read their lives, you'll find that they struggled with the word itself. They read those massive commentaries, and it takes time to read them, and they struggled with them. They read books on doctrine and, and on theology, and thus they deepened, and they got a deeper understanding, and they were bigger men and women, and they began to know something about the higher reaches of the spiritual life, the possibilities in the life of grace. You don't enter in and then just maintain that the rest of your life. No, no, you go on, launch out into the deep. You press forward after this mark, this prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. My friends, is there evidence of growth and of development and of enlargement in your life? Do you resent the effort or are you making an effort? Do you say, oh, well, I've got all I want. That's enough for me. I am the kind, haven't you? Well, if you haven't, you see, it just means you don't know what's in the treasure house. 
You've just poked your head in through the door. You say, very wonderful. Yes, all right. I'm, as long as I'm somewhere in the precincts. Oh, go take hold of your catalog, I say. Study it. Look at each item. Stand back. Have another view of it. Examine it closely. You've got your guidebook. Well, go around the exhibition. You haven't much time, you know. Time's passing. It's fleeting. There are treasures here. This unsearchable riches of Christ, this love of God and Christ, which passes knowledge, the truth of God, the mind of Christ. Are we satisfied with the mere first principles, the beginnings, the elementary statements, the childish position? I say if we are, we'd better examine ourselves again very thoroughly. Because there is an instinct about life that makes one desire more and more. The man who truly appreciates is the man who wants more. He can't be satisfied. And as a final argument under this heading, the man who really has this life in him, he desires more and more of this knowledge and of this truth in order that he may help others. You see, he's not living to himself any longer. He's got understanding. And he wants to help these others. How can a man help others if he doesn't know, if he can't explain? The Apostle Peter, again in his first epistle and in the third chapter, says, Be ready at all times to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Or as a hymn puts it, Men die in darkness at thy side without a hope to cheer the tomb. Take up the torch and wave it wide. See, that's the argument. Or again, the Apostle Paul in Philippians 2. He says, you know, you are as lights in the heaven. Luminaries shining in the darkness of the night. The world is in darkness. And you, because you've been born again, have become the lights of the world because you are parts of the light of the world and reflections of his light shine in he says holding forth the word of life amidst a crooked and perverse generation of people and the man who's got spiritual understanding and apprehension he feels this he says how can I help these people well he can't help them if he doesn't know himself Experience is essential, but merely to relate your experience doesn't answer people's questions. So, you feel the desire to know the truth and to have an understanding of it so that you can explain it and expound it to others and give them answers to their questions and help them in every conceivable way. Those are the things that urge a man to desire for more and more of this spiritual apprehension which he has received as the gift of God. But come, let me work out that last statement of mine a little more in detail. I'll put it as a separate principle, which I believe is my tenth test of this new life in Christ Jesus. It is a concern for the unregenerate. The regenerate has a concern for the unregenerate. Again, surely... This uh, follows and doesn't need any demonstration. We've already had a great illustration of this in the first chapter of John's Gospel. You remember when we came to those cameos, the pictures of the first disciples whom our Lord called. John the Baptist was standing one day with two of his disciples, and he pointed out and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And they went and they spoke to our Lord. And uh, he took them to his house. They came and saw where he dwelt and a bird with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Then we read, one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. And do you remember that uh, Philip did exactly the same Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. See, this is a sort of instinct, which is the characteristic of this life. And later on, you read in a most interesting way about the ordinary Christians in Jerusalem. A great persecution broke out in the early church, quite at the beginning. You read about it in chapter 8, of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And this is what one reads. 
As for Saul, that's the one who became Paul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, the word translated preaching is the most interesting one. Somebody suggested that a very good translation would be this. Uh, they, therefore, that were scattered abroad went everywhere gossiping the word, gossiping it. Uh, we are told in the next verse, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That's proclamation. He was an evangelist, a preacher. That's proclamation. These didn't preach in that sense. The two words are different. They spoke it in conversation. They explained it. They gave others an understanding. They said, we are persecuted and we are persecuted for this reason. And they began to tell people about the truth. Everywhere they went as the result of this, the apostles alone were left in, in Jerusalem. But these others were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. All verse 1 tells us except the apostles. Now here are the ordinary Christian people. And what they do is they tell others about this. Why? Well, because they've got a concern for them. Now, this, again, I want to try to show, is a very subtle test. It's a very good test to differentiate between a religious person and a truly Christian person. The religious person does not have this concern about the unregenerate. He is religious, and he's generally satisfied with his religion, and he's generally self-satisfied. So he has no time for us. He's all right, therefore... That's the religious person, not so with the Christian, with the spiritually minded person. You see, the religious man not only hasn't got a concern for the others, he's got nothing to offer them. He's a good man. He lives a moral life. And he's amazed that these others don't, and he looks at them and despises them. He's the Pharisee, of course. He's not really concerned about them, and still more important, he's got nothing to give them. You can't give your morality to somebody else. You can't give you a rectitude to another man. You see a man in the gutter, how terrible. You can't help him. But the Christian doesn't look at the men in the gutter like that. You remember, don't you, the parable of the Good Samaritan? Well, there it is. Now then, here's a very good test, therefore. There is in the man who's got new life himself a concern about those whom he sees to be lacking in it. But there's a problem that arises just here. And I think it's an important one. I think it's one of those more or less subtle distinctions, which nevertheless is really important. Somebody may say to me, but you can't be right in what you're saying. I know many people at the present time whom I don't regard as Christians. I can't regard them as born-again Christians, but they're tremendously zealous. And they are manifesting a great proselytizing zeal. They don't believe the gospel, as you and I do, but they come round our doors and they'll give up their Saturday afternoons and they're selling literature and they're distributing leaflets and tracts. This tremendous zeal of the cults and these aberrations from the Christian truth. Now, says somebody, surely your point therefore collapses. You are saying that the, one of the tests and the signs of the fact that a man has this new life of God is that he has a concern about others and he does something about it. What about these people? Now, I grant this is a most important question. And it seems to me that the answer to the question reveals the true nature of this spiritual life which is from God. There is such a thing as a carnal zeal, even in connection with Christianity, as you get the same carnal zeal with these cults and false religions that are round and about us at the present time. How do you tell the difference between the two? Well, I suggest that these are some of the tests. With the false, with the carnal, these are the characteristics. It is invariably suggested to people to do this by the authorities. It isn't that a man feels the desire to do it, he's told to do it. He's in, get another. He's put into it at once, it's a part of an organization. The man doesn't work it out as it were, it doesn't come from his heart 
No, no, it's imposed upon him. He becomes a part of a system. It's the thing to do. And the moment you're in, you start your activity and your working. Now, the very way in which these people do their work and the way in which they talk about it always seems to me to betray them completely. There is a lightness, there is a glibness, there is a mechanical element about it which marks it for what it is. In addition, there is generally an element of excitement. Anything that's organized and worked up and done in this way by numbers, there's always this element of excitement. Carnality is always excited. And you see it coming out in this kind of activity. Another way of putting it is perhaps that the technique is always so obvious. They all do it in almost exactly the same way. They almost look the same and appear the same and they speak in the same way. It is a technique. And it's always characterized, of course, by cliches and by certain pet phrases and expressions. And you're always given the impression that what they're really out for is the success of the cause. Their interest always in numbers. An interest in numbers is always indicative of carnality. And they're impatient with you. They want to get adherence. They want to get numbers. They want to be able to state how many have been obtained. That's the whole attitude. It's mechanical. It's carnal. It's worldly minded. It's the method of big business rather than what we are talking about. And so you get this element of impatience manifesting itself. But what of this other thing of which I'm trying to speak? Much more difficult to put into words, but it's very real and very different. It is, you see, the difference between life and mechanism. It's the difference between fruit growing on a tree and the manufactured counterfeit. Oh, how subtle this is. I'm pressing this because... Unless I'm old enough to have seen a great deal along this line in my pastoral life and experience. You've seen people, they've come into the Christian life and they've been so busy and so active, you've rather felt you've never been a Christian. This is the first. But where are they now? What's happened to them? Right outside the church and the Christian life. It was nothing but a carnal zeal. The devil will persuade us to do that even in the Christian life. This counterfeit of his, you can have this great zeal, proselytizing zeal, with the false. And it tries to insinuate itself into the true. But the characteristic of the true is this, is that this element of spontaneity. It's something that arises within. It isn't that a man is told, now get out, do this, that and the other. No, no, here's a man who's become conscious of this life of God in his soul, got this spiritual apprehension, and he begins to think. And he begins to observe others. He realizes the darkness they're in, and he begins, therefore, to be conscious of a concern within him. He's almost afraid to speak to them. You know, I almost always prefer a Christian who's afraid at first to tackle another, rather than the Christian who does it with extreme ease. There's a sensitiveness about this. There's a respect for another's personality. It's a good sign that. It's the man man who does it in spite of that initial difficulty is the one who to me is demonstrating the truly spiritual life. You see, here's a man who because he's got an understanding of the truth begins to feel a deep concern for others. Not anxious to get proselytes. But he is troubled about them. He's worried about them. He knows a grief of soul concerning them. He experiences something of an agony concerning them. Paul talks about making up in his own body what remains of the sufferings of Christ. He came into the world because of his grief for our lost souls. And he shuddered and grieved at the grave of Lazarus and again in the garden of Gethsemane. Now the man who's got his life in him is a man who doesn't do things mechanically. Uh, The devil can produce that and man himself can arrange and organize that. But here is a man who knows something of a soul agony for the souls of others. He feels something of the compassion that our Lord felt. We are told that our Lord looked out on the multitude. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd and he had compassion upon them. And the man, I say, who's got something of his life, he knows something of this compassion. 
And he's not light-hearted, setting out to get at new adherents and converts. There's a deep seriousness again in him in, in this matter. This seriousness is something that runs right through the life of the man who is truly born again. He realizes what he's doing, that it's not something light and glib and easy. He's dealing with a soul. Eternal destiny is involved. The Holy Spirit is engaged. And so there is this deep seriousness. I've heard men talking about handling souls. Well, I don't want to amuse you. I nearly said, I remember one poor man, it happened to be his business and his trade. I always felt that when he talked about souls, he was talking in much the same way as he talked about handling fish. But the man who's got this life in him, he realizes that the thing is too serious, it's too profound, it's an eternal matter. So he's a man, I say, who prays about this. The soul is on his heart and he prays to God. He may be in an agony. This is the true, the, the spiritual thing. And above all, he has a great patience. He knows that he would not be what he is were it not for the patience of the Lord with him. So if a man doesn't accept his formula immediately, he doesn't leave him in disgust and go on to the next. No, no, he's patient, he's long-suffering. He's ready to bear with him. He's got such a concern for the man's soul. He will not let him go. Because he belongs to the Lord that would not let him go. And thus in his life, you see, in his attitude towards the unregenerate, he is producing, reproducing, or rather there is reproduced in him the life of his blessed Lord and Master. My friends, do we know much about this concern, real deep concern for the souls of others? Does it weigh upon us? Do we know something of the burden? Yea, let me take it and enlarge it. Do you feel something of the burden of the whole present situation? Does it grieve you? Does it trouble you? Are you praying about it? Do you realize that nothing but a great outpouring of the Spirit of God can deal with such a situation? Or are you still in the realm of organizing? What do we do about it? These are the tests. The spiritual outlook is one that realizes the depth and the gravity of the problem, but also the heights and the endless limits of the grace of God. Well, God willing, we'll go on with this examination next Sunday morning, but may he give us grace to examine ourselves in the light of some of these thoughts. The closing hymn is hymn number 404, 404. We praise and bless thee, gracious Lord, our Savior, kind and true, for all the old things passed away, for all thou hast made new. 404. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.